Welcome, everybody. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley, and every week we post recordings that we have made talking with wildly interesting people all over the world. Who are we? Well, we are part of Rotary International, 1.2 million people around the world and 36,000 clubs who work to make their communities better. Our focus is the same. How can we help our, our, our communities become better locally, globally, and digitally? And so we have a special focus in our service on education, entrepreneurship, and innovation. And you're going to get to hear about quite a bit of that today as we talk to our speakers, Jan Brown and Bill Whipple. Jan is a retired educator and Bill is a retired dietitian. And now they live in Rwanda where they are making a difference in the lives of, of others there, hand in hand with people who care about having a wonderfully interesting place to be personally, professionally, and academically. So with that, Jan and Bill, it is so good to have you with us. Uh, it, is, it is the stage being the it, the stage is yours. Go right ahead. Thank you, Rushton and Maraho from the land of a thousand hills, commonly known as Rwanda. I'm Jan Brown, the founder and president of Teach Rwanda. We are a tiny INGO that is having a pretty amazing impact on the lives of Rwandan children, teachers, and their families. I'm Bill Whipple, Jan's husband, Teach Rwanda's business representative, and the coordinator of our Bright School Stella Future Hopes Lego Robotics Team. A Lego robotics team in a small rural school with many vulnerable children and only Rwandan teachers? Yes. Our Future Hopes students are just 12 of the remarkable successes that Teach Rwanda has been the catalyst for in this landlocked, densely populated, low-income country with aspirations to become a technological giant in Africa. Here's our love story. It all began with a 2 a.m. call in January 2012 from a Rwandan teacher to me in the U.S. Mama Jen, help! I just started my own preschool. All of us who worked with you at Chakaburi School quit our jobs. Now, what just retired teacher could pass up an opportunity like that, especially when you have no desire to be bored? So a few days later, I kissed Bill goodbye. We weren't married then and hopped on a plane to Kigali. For the first three years, Jan was on her own in Rwanda. She quickly realized that local teachers were eager to know what is a magnifying glass, how to read children's storybooks for the first time, and to be kind, respectful, and joyful educators. We kept in touch by email when she was in Africa, which became more and more frequent. Our wedding in Pennsylvania had a Rwandan theme. Even our vows were in French. Soon after that, Bill retired as a clinical dietitian and moved to Rwanda. We started out living in Mohanga, where our school is, and then moved to Kigali to be at the epicenter of Rwanda's development. So what's our mission now? We connect our staff and students, ages three to 14, with children and teachers in the rest of the world. Most schools here expect students to sit quietly, obey, memorize, and pass exams. Not us. In Teach Rwanda schools, we expect children to explore, ask questions, and figure things out for themselves. Our teachers are curious, flexible, and so excited to see their students learn by doing. Let's watch this short video. As these three primary, primary three students at Bright School designed, built, and even fortified a hydroelectric dam all in a morning. This is real hands-on learning. The most frequent comment we get from visitors to our exemplary school is amazing. Children in preschool typically build with blocks on the floor while a nearby teacher encourages them to experiment with gravity, measurements, and balance. Children illustrate their own stories, often with scribbles, after which teachers write children's explanations. Our teachers are kind, encouraging, and ensure that their students develop knowledge, skills, analytical thinking, and executive function skills. Our students and staff are Rwanda's future leaders. No question, Bright School students are different. They are confident, 
curious and talkative. That's why shortly after Bright Preschool opened, families began to demand that we expand into primary. We resisted for three years and then realized that if we really loved the community, our families, our students, and our teachers, well, we had to grow. Year by year, we added another classroom starting with P1. We moved from one small rented house to a bigger rented office building to an even bigger rented building. And now we're buying land, building classrooms, and we'll soon have a Rotary Global grant to build a kitchen and bakery. Four more classrooms are almost ready for construction on one of Rwanda's 1,000 hills. Our first primary students are now in P6, almost ready to go to secondary school, which usually means boarding school. So children and families are begging us to expand again. But we're not ready yet. First, we need to finish our campus, especially for our Lego robotics team, our future hopes one. We're working with a Burundian engineer, Eric Birabuz, and his STEM nonprofit called Stella in Corning, New York, to design a dedicated space for our Rwandan leaders, students, and computers, and the robots. That's Eric in the middle, wearing a black mask. With the help of a retired school librarian, we have amassed a collection of award-winning, culturally relevant fiction and nonfiction books for children at Bright. Every week, all preschool and primary students reenact these books. They pretend to be the characters, create their own costumes, and make their own sets. Literacy is creative and exciting. During COVID school closures, we operated a mobile library. So students continued weekly story times and read with their families at home. Teachers prepared weekly guides to encourage learning through play and projects. During the lockdown, families sent us a barrage of videos and photos to demonstrate children's gardening, sewing, furniture painting, cooking, pretend play, brick construction, and much more. For our vulnerable families, such as those who were forbidden to sell fruit on their heads, as they had done before COVID, we provided emergency food and simple cell phones. That way, our teachers could stay in touch with every child and every family every week. What a great team, technology and books. Our students also have had partnerships with schools in the US. They've Zoomed, posted on Flipgrid to share their creative puppets, dancing and singing and vocabulary in each other's languages. Success in Rwanda looks a lot like success anywhere else in the world, especially when evidence-based, respectful, caring education is at the forefront of everyone's hearts and minds. Now, just to make our story believable, let us tell you about a few of our challenges. Many families in Luhanga, an hour outside of Kigali, can't afford school fees, so our private, Nonprofit school has scholarships, which donors pay for. Some of our Fund of Future students would be on the streets if it weren't for the generosity of our friends. School fees are just $50 per term, far beyond the reach of many families in an area where teachers take home about $100 a month. Teach Rwanda has its own high standards for class sizes, no more than 25 and teacher skills, world-class understandings, based on Jan's work with two school accreditation systems during her first 50-year career in teacher education. Our nonprofit school also meets Rwandan standards, which is why we're required to have our own campus. Until now, we've only been given temporary government accreditation. That explains why donor support is so vital to help us build the facilities needed for a full campus including a kitchen for the recently re required school feeding program, nutritious lunches designed to reduce stunting, which is about 40% here, will soon be served at Bright School. Mentoring local teachers is at the heart of what Teacher Rhonda does. We hire kind people who are eager to learn and mentor them with workshops and in-class visits for a couple of years. One of the most difficult things for teachers to change is the questions they ask. They have been taught to demand, how many are there? What color is that? We help them practice asking open-ended questions and make encouraging comments such as, 
what is your plan? Or tell me more about your construction. The result? Children tell a whole story. One of our most creative teachers is now a remarkable teacher mentor. The difference we see in children's capacity is truly astonishing. Families tell us their neighbor's preschool children might be able to count to 20, but those children cannot bring them two potatoes to cook for dinner. Right, school children know what two is and will not only bring the two potatoes, but will help peel them, cook dinner, and set the table. What's so amazing about that? Well, tradition here is to help children with everything. I've seen adults feeding eight-year-olds with a spoon and teach Rhonda schools starting at the age of three. Children pour their own porridge, put on their own shoes, and even clean up after they finish free playtime. Visitors are shocked. University faculty and others who come to Bright School tell us they're astounded by what our primary children can do too. Every year before COVID, we had about a thousand visitors. When you come to Bright, you'll see classroom walls covered with children's long stories about a garage trip in which P6 students changed a tire and classroom floors filled with handmade mud and leaf replicas of volcanoes, like where Rwanda's gorillas live. Or let's watch as P4 children work in teams, breaking eggs and then cooking omelets with a traditional cardboard plate. Okay, they're domestic animals and their role in Rhonda's economic development. Even our headmaster came to eat as students cut their delicious omelets in seven or eight or nine pieces. Nutrition, chemistry, fractions, and culture experienced hands-on at an understandable real level in P4. Did you notice that somehow we managed to shift our story from our daily challenges to the lifelong opportunities that a high quality education opens up for every student, even those with disabilities and those who live with daily trauma? For sure. Our school is just now emerging from the struggling stage as we build our own campus, thanks to Rotary Global Grants and other major donors who are also passionate about what we do. Our Rondon teachers are mentoring their colleagues during observation visits and in our workshops. A few former teachers are now in leadership positions with us, like our headmaster and teacher mentor, or with other INGOs and reading programs they started. Our oldest students are ready to launch into secondary, although we're not ready for them to go. Earlier this this year, our Future Hopes LEGO Robotics team captured the imagination of Rwanda's Minister of ICT and Innovation, who's an MIT graduate. She's the one wearing the white jacket in the video. Minister Paula Ingeria was delighted to see children in P4, 5, and 6, who were so eager to explain how to build robots that hold together when they crash and to program them to turn corners and pick up objects. We can only imagine what will happen when these students, some of whom are stunted and have never left Muhanga, will do when they start competing with other robotics teams internationally. Imagine, we've grown from a tiny classroom with just one box of Crayola crayons and some ancient donated Mac computers to a national innovative system that mentors teachers to promote learning through play, to prepare children to design their own robots, and the dream of becoming doctors, pilots, and tech-savvy dance and music therapists. So that's our love story. Two people who married in their 60s, not for the first time, and who've devoted a decade to what has become our second beloved family in Rwanda. We even have a two-year-old Rwandan grandchild. His father, the one in the white shirt, hopes Sweet Pea will become a future Rwandan education minister. If we weren't living this dream, we would never have believed our INGO could be the catalyst for play to change so many lives. Murakose Chani, Chani. Thank, thank, thank you so, so much. much. How fun. That's awesome, Jan. Thank you and Bill for the story. And we're excited to ask you some questions. Let me first introduce the people that we have on our recording. Uh, Jan and Bill meet, uh, meet three, three members of the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. You know me, Rushton Hurley. 
Uh, and then we also have with us our treasurer, Cecilia Babkirk, and uh, our, our, our Houston representative, uh, retired judge Rory Olson. And so let's, let's kind of start the questions uh, on this. First of all, the, the robotics program is particularly exciting. You think about a rural school and the opportunities that kids have to, to begin to, to jump into something like robotics. That's part of, a, that's part of a, a connection you made with someone here in the States you described, right? Can you tell us a little more about that? Well, Eric uh, Birabuz, who's a uh, Burundian born engineer, who's married to a Rwandan, but has been with Corning uh, Company in uh, Corning, New York for over 25 years. He's award-winning engineer. Uh, he discovered us through a person who was his best man, who was actually talking to our grandson in a restaurant. When he was a tiny baby, and this guy liked children, and he came over to our table, and a stranger carried off our grandchild, what? and that led to the robotics team. When Eric saw the way our children learned by doing and projects and hands-on, he, he knew that was the best place for the first robotics team to start in Rwanda. So he, it was a two-year process because COVID came in and delayed it, but uh, he was in love with Bright School and we saw that what a wonderful opportunity this was for our children. Now, that that Jan, you've had experience training teachers before is, is another powerful piece of the story, right? So, you know, I think of teachers in a lot of low resource areas where the, essentially they, they are taught to deliver a very stale and boring kind of curriculum, right? You know, and just like, you know, do this, do this, do this, which is all about kind of tracking what the teacher has said. Um, how, how, much, how much work is it where you are? Because this, this is certainly true in parts of the United States as well. How much work is it where you are to get the teachers to embrace the idea that open-ended questions and, and having the kids be more active and things like that? How, how, does that, how does that go? It's a challenge, but once teachers see it in action, they realize, ah, oh, I can do this. And they realize how much fun it is. They see how joyful the children are. They realize that when they choose themes about things they already know and care about, like the weather or cassava, things that are relevant to the children that the children want to learn more about, and they soon, their creativity just blossoms. They find resources, they walk out the door and there's a caterpillar crawling, or Perhaps they pick banana fiber and children make ropes with them or little purses or watches or whatever they want to do. And so low resource areas really are full of resources because there are rocks and fields and sky and trees and people doing interesting things in the community. And so it doesn't take a lot of money to do a really interesting program where children can be creative and Teachers can be, be creative and they discover together the joy of learning and being curious. I, I love that point that, that low resource areas are not without lots of resources. Well, well said. Uh -huh. Rory, I think you've got a question. Yes, uh, Friday, I was in a seminar uh, the State Bar put on and they were talking about how the pandemic COVID-19 has permanently or at least long-term affected the court system. And they were talking about, there are courts here in Texas that are three years behind. So if we never have another case of COVID, it's gonna take forever and a day to get caught up. Well, I noticed in some of your slides, there were people wearing masks. So I have to ask, did COVID affect your students to any great degree? And how did it change what you do? It only affected our students in that they all do wear their masks. Rhonda has been very strict about COVID restrictions. Schools were closed for a long time, but because we had our mobile library, children kept up with the curriculum really quite well. We only had 
one student ever identified with COVID. He came in the morning and went home at lunch. He was in a family of eight COVID patients. We cleaned the room and never had a single other case the times that we were open and closed. So it didn't really affect their learning. It affected the health of very few people. None of our teachers ever got it. We are still wearing masks every day. They have now, I think students from the ages of 12 and older and all the teachers have been fully immunized. So uh, we're not really behind. In fact, we learned a lot during COVID that we have continued to do. So in many ways, COVID had some benefits too, but yeah, yes. Well, one of the benefits it had for us is that we were able to educate the parents uh, on how children learn through doing, because many of the things that they do around the house have math and science and uh, language and culture. And so since they were not coming into school, we had worksheets that gave the parents guidance and they sent us videos and they still were able to come once a week to hear a story read and check out a book. But it really helped the parents get away from the idea that school's own learning is only something that really happens in a school and, and begin to have a better awareness of not only it happens everywhere, but they can also be a part of it. And unlike many schools, we continue to pay our teachers. So our teachers were very grateful. The families that are vulnerable have appreciated the food. And in fact, we still do food distributions for a few families who've not been able to regain employment. So um, it was a, a, a learning experience and we are all happy that we washed our hands <laughs> for many, many days. Mm -hmm. Cecilia, I think you have a question. Uh, yes, I have a couple. They're kind of connected. Um, and so what do you, are, is, uh, first of all, is your school actually in Kigali where you, <laughs> you have connectivity and electricity and things like that? I assume that it is because that, is, of course, is one of the really big challenges in rural schools all over the developing world, not just Africa. Well, Mahanga is only an hour outside of Kigali. And in the past 10 years, one of Rhonda's big development challenges has been to get electricity throughout the country. So in Mahanga, it's on most of the time. <laughs> it went off yesterday. And sometimes if you're using a projector, that's a problem. Yesterday, our internet connection failed while we were on a Zoom call with Eric Yerbuz in New York, but it came back on eventually. The water goes on and off frequently, but we've learned to live with all those things. So, yeah. yeah. We're not exactly rural. It's bigger than rural, but it's not Kigali. It's a small city. Got it, got it. And we carry batteries. It's, it's like a step between Kigali or Addis Ababa and where I lived, where we might not have electricity for two weeks and connectivity. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that yeah. was always, always a big yeah. challenge um, because their, their network out there is 2G when it works, which means you can't do oh. any streaming, oh. you cannot email pictures. Um, in fact, you really can hardly do email, but what amazingly worked almost all the time. Um, and so now, how, do, how are you managing, for example, to get your school buildings built? Before we move off of the uh, rural nature of it, when Jan first came here, she had to get up at two o'clock in the morning to use the internet. <laughs> yeah. Now it's available at other times. But right. go ahead, you can listen. So we're managing to build our buildings by doing fundraising with a lot of donors that we have known and supported us and some people who are fairly new to that. Building on hillsides though, I grew up in Iowa and it's not quite Rhonda. <laughs> so nothing is flat here and you have to account for the strength of your retaining walls yes. and the, uh, how steep the slope is and many other things. So there are challenges, but we're learning a lot about soil erosion and the kinds oh. of things that we can do to mitigate that and how to harvest water, how to use solar power, because there's plenty of all those things available to us. Right, 
Right, right. Same thing in southern Ethiopia. And, you know, in my community, the school, it happened that some NGO gave money and two of our buildings were built using concrete block construction. But there were eight buildings in total and all the rest and the buildings at the uh, primary school are all built from mud and stick. And so as is most of the housing, that's how I lived. I mean, I joke that I lived in a mud hut, but in fact, that's what it was. <laughs> and so- Yeah, so Rwanda is leading people away from the mud bricks, but a lot of the buildings are that. Right now you're not allowed to do them, but we are looking at compressed brick, which is used from the soil and there's a small amount of concrete added to it and you know, can be uh, resourceful. Yeah. Yes, we are familiar with those. <laughs> well, this is not even mud brick. It's mud, uh, maybe, maybe there's straw and you know, and it's just kind of mashed in between poles that are that way, you know, there's sideways uh, and uh, uprights and then they just stuff a bunch uh, of mud in there. And then if they have the resources, they plaster that over, but many do not. So. So that's the school buildings are all mostly built that way. And that's one of the things that, um, pardon all that noise in the background. I'm outside and there's a noisemaker out here, but um, <laughs> but that's one of the issues, you know, I'm, I'm also working on uh, my second global grant for my community and none of it is dedicated to construction because of all the restrictions by the Rotary Foundation on constructing buildings. So uh, trying to yeah. figure out how to get buildings done, but am doing a lot of other things. And, you know, connectivity, it's really hard in those places. And so I'm going to, I'm going to have, I have friends who are donating money individually with me to do a solar array so that we can have our ICT room be functional at all times. So that sounds like good a good idea. idea. Yes. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. So uh, last question for you. The, the, the team that you've got at the school, uh, the, these like, like we're talking about the teachers, uh, sports staff, the leadership, all Rwandan. Is that right? That's right. Yep. Excellent. I, you know, it seems to me that that's, that's, that's a nice recipe for sustainability there for sure. That's the beginning part of it. Yes. Yes. Biggest challenge in, in getting everything going. What, what would you say? I'd say that a lot of this knowledge is something that's not over here. When you talk about sustainability, we have not completely gotten away for the need for like, especially ECE child centered education knowledge to be to be brought in here that's the one area we don't know that we could replace locally but other than that um we you know we can educate people into you know good practices and of course that's what you need it doesn't you know it's not going to sustain if you don't have people here who know how to do it who believe in it and want to want it to keep going Fantastic. Uh, to uh, we'll, we'll wind things down, and then, as we always like to do, we'll hand it back to the speaker for the final word. And then, once we stop recording, we'll keep talking to these folks because that's a perk of getting involved in the recordings. You get to keep talking to interesting people, like uh, like Jan and Bill, which is good fun. So, uh, for those of you who have been joining us and are curious to learn more, there there are links below the video on our meeting page that can take you to. Uh, to sites to tell you more about Bright School and uh, Jan and Bill's work. Uh, we ask that you do several other things, two other things on, on our site, one of which is to let us know you're here. It's always good for us to know who's been, uh, who's been visiting so that we can, uh, we can recognize you. Uh, there is an automatic email that gets generated uh, to your email address that you type in the attendance form, which you can pass along to your club secretary for a makeup at, a, uh, at, at your Rotary Club if you are working to track uh, yourself at 100% attendance to get that, that regular infusion of, of rotary service energy, which I hope you're doing. Uh, additionally, a little farther down the page, you'll see our discussion forum, Discuss, D-I-S-Q-U-S. Leave a comment. What did you think of the program? What did you think of the other elements of the meeting? You can reply to other people who are in the meeting as well, or, or who have left comments, and we welcome your thoughts along those lines. As we always like to do, we hand it back to our speaker for the final word. So 
Uh, Bill, Jan, I, I, I pass the mic back to you. All right, thank you, Russian. I just hope you all remember the message that even the most vulnerable children in rural Rwanda can thrive when they have access to high quality evidence-based education. And it is possible because the world is full of resources that every child can learn to appreciate. Wonderful. Thank you again. And for all of you who have joined us, we will see you next week.